Hi everyone, uh, and welcome back to the gaming classroom. Today we're trying out something new. We're going to be watching Keizu's analysis on Yataro's farming patterns, and we'll get straight to it. Hey guys, today I'm going to show you what the best carry player in the world, Yatoro, does to farm as efficiently as possible in any Dota game. This is one of the most efficient farming patterns. I've decided to name this concept the ping pong technique because it allows you to bounce back and forth from the jungle to the lane according to your situation in the game. There are three main variations of this concept. Let me show you using one of Yatoro's recent Luna games. This concept is very simple to also replicate. Let's look at exactly what he does. Generally, you want to start doing this around like minute six to 10 is like the best time to do it. And the heroes who do this in the best way are ones that have inherent, inherent farming abilities such as Luna, Sven, Medusa, Templar Assassin, but other heroes like Morph, Slark, Razor, they can do it too. This is going to be variation number one. Variation one where you feel very safe. So before we jump into the first variation, one thing I want to highlight when it comes to these kinds of strategies is two concepts that he actually introduces, which is number one, timing. It's when do you actually do it? And then character, which is which characters have a natural inclination or natural tendency to do it. So these are important factors to think about because when you think about strategies, for example, in your software engineering career or your negotiation strategies, you have to understand the timing and you also need to understand the natural tendencies or which kinds of characters actually want to do a certain thing, right? Like these carries want to farm, they have a natural farming ability or these carries want to dominate a lane, that's what they want to do. That's their natural tendency. You can kill the wave up here the creep wave and you kill it as fast as possible because your main goal is to create a lot of time once this creep wave is dead you have freedom until the second wave arrives anywhere close to your lane which now allows you time to farm in the jungle so your toro instantly kills the creep wave walks over to the left he gets to farm an ogre camp now at minute six now he walks back to the lane and as you can see he comes perfectly back in time for the second creep wave click 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 kill all the creeps it's 650, which means the next creep wave is already here very soon. He sees both the supports on the vision that his Kanka is giving him, so he doesn't feel in any danger, which means hit the lane creeps and start running towards the jungle. You can see that even before killing the camp, he's posturing towards the left and farming. So creep wave gets killed, easy camp gets farmed. We farm to the left, which is going to give him another medium camp. Upon finishing this, we're going to walk back to the lane. How much have we missed? Maybe one lane creep, but we gain two jungle camps. Minute seven... So one thing I want to highlight here is it's amazing how Keju is like carefully doing the calculations. And I think this is the thing that differentiates professional Dota players from scrubs like me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a legend scrub. So the interesting thing is that they learn how to maximize these kinds of things and they do the counting. They do the math behind it, right? Is it worth, to, like you, you saw on the screen, he pointed out the gold that you actually earn. He counted, right? You earn two jungle camps, you lose one lane creep. You, you still win out by the gold, you, you, you win out by the XP. So when you think about it from like your professional situation, right? Like when you're thinking about it from a software engineering perspective, it's knowing when you take advantage of these timings and having some measure or some way to quantify the potential returns and costs to these kinds of things. And it's being vigilant to observe those kinds of costs. So this is a great call to action to write things down. Measure how long it takes you to do certain things. Analyze as well the cost to do certain things. For example, this might be estimating how long does it take me to actually write a task when I'm actually doing software engineering or coming up with those estimates for a certain task, okay, this certain chunk of work is gonna take me three hours to maybe six hours and then seeing how accurate that is, right? Only by actually measuring, can you actually compare your actual performance? Like, did you actually do it in six hours, in three hours and whatnot? Because when you look at Luna here, he's actually measuring, okay, how much time do I actually need to actually complete this jungle camp to get back to the next jungle camp? Do I have space for the next jungle camp or do I have to run back to my lane, right? So it all comes down to measurements. It all comes down to paying attention and doing the numbers and being like, okay, only when we do measurements can we actually optimize and uh, improve.
740. So now it depends. Okay, what do we see on the map? Look at your Toro's vision. He doesn't see the ET. He doesn't see the Pugna. But most importantly, who do you not see? He doesn't see the Storm. Storm could be anywhere. Storm could have TP ready. Which means right now, we can't just go and kill the wave here and then farm left. That would put you in a very dangerous position. This is going to be variation too. What the enemy mid can gank you. He farms the wave in the tower and he's going to be ready to farm south side. Because now that... So what's beautiful about what he's talking about here is that this is basically probability theory, right? When you have a limited amount of information, which is what you look, what you see in the minimap, you have to come up with your probabilities. Okay, where are these certain heroes most likely present? And which zones are actually hot? Which zones are actually safe? An application of this concept in software engineering might be thinking about the risk of actually migrating your versions to the latest version. That might be high risk. It might not be something that we actually want to do at a certain period in time. Because if, for example, the business is currently trying to accelerate and get um, a lot of uh, market share and, and adoption of the application, then this period of time might be more busy creating new features and uh, ensuring that the usability of the application is very good. So this might not be the appropriate time because you guys are trying to do something else. On the other hand, when you have more information, the app is stable, you can see how your users are using your application. There doesn't seem to be like strong competition in the product that you're developing then there's very little risk. So these are the times where, hey, okay, we might have the space and time to invest in migrating our older version applications to the newer ones, because we can handle this risk. We have more information. We feel uh, confident to take on this risk. Oh, the tower will protect him and he can farm this camp very easily still. If they dive him, he has stick, he has 1100 HP with strength threads, they can TP and help him out. Same story again, farm the wave here, then farm this camp. Then you take the next wave, you do it again. Storm Spirit has now just shown in the mid lane. And this is going to be where we have variation number three. It's the most safe one while still being around the safe lane and the safe jungle, which is where you ditch the lane. Because now it depends on what you see on the map. Storm is fully fogging. There's some other stuff fogging. Like you don't really see what's going on. People are starting to get their ultimates. Like, you know, Mag could have RP, which means this is the first time where you are not looking fully back at the lane. You're farming all the way left until your enemies give you more information. The more information you have, the better information you can make about where to farm. All right, so, right so this is really important. And I think it ties into the current situation in the job market for the tech community. There's very little information right now, or at least uh, fewer opportunities, because there's a lot of tech layoffs going on. A lot of companies right now are trying to go through restructuring or trying to optimize their costs because of the economy. So in these situations, what's the ideal thing to do? It's to try as much as possible to gain as much information as you can about the business that you're in and uh, trying to create as much value as you can. But otherwise, be conservative in general. It's be conservative. And, you know, in general, when the economy is really strong and, and performing really well, you have the opportunity to, you know, negotiate strong and, you know, capital and money is uh, easy for businesses to access. So um, promotions and acquiring, you know, great talent, you know, you have these opportunities to land great jobs in different companies. But in an economy where we're slowing down, there are a lot of tech layoffs, you'll notice that you can't really prioritize the high value lane creeps because that's not something accessible right now, right? Like it's risky. So in the game, what you do is you go through the lower value jungle creeps, but it keeps you safe. So in this kind of comparison, like in your professional life, it might not be to strongly negotiate for promotions or trying to land a new job position somewhere else that might compensate you better. It might be lower gains kind of returns, which might be uh, reinvesting in yourself, taking on some... Coursera work or plural site subscription to invest in yourself. So these might be the time to take on these kinds of conservative investments so that later on when new information comes in, you can go back to actually doing what you want, you know, taking your lane creeps or negotiating strong. So these are the times where you're like, okay, 
maybe now is the time for me to invest in learning how to communicate better or learning how to express myself better or learning a little bit more about business so that I can negotiate better with my boss or companies that I work with uh, when I apply for their work. When there's no information, keep yourself safe. And um, there are still options, basically. There are still options for you to get good returns. You just have to think about what are the more conservative options. So right now he's like, okay, I don't know where Storm is. I don't know where Pugna is. I'm just going to farm all the way left. So this is the first time in four minutes that he has given up lane creeps. Storm has been fogging for a long time. So here you take maybe a little bit of a gamble in terms of how you posture. There's no camps left down below. He wants to start walking towards the lane in hopes that the Storm will show. Storm Spirit shows mid, Pagna shows mid. This now allows you a Toro. Okay, let's farm more aggressively, right? Let's posture more aggressively into the lane again. The so I just want to interrupt here a little bit and highlight that as the new information pours in, right? Heroes are showing on the mid lane. He realizes the state of the map, the state where risk and safety is, has changed. So because of that, this is really how professionals demonstrate that mastery. They see information, they absorb it, they apply it immediately. They take that space that they know they can have, right? They're not in danger. That's something that we software engineers also have to recognize that as new information comes in, and that information can come from the different teammates that we work with, or numbers from marketing or sales, or the performance of the, cust the customer support teams. These are information that we can actually work and talk to people and understand how the business is doing. This helps us become more cross-functional and we gain access to information. And from the gaming perspective, this is the mini-map in Dota 2, but in the company, in, in, a, in a company, in a startup, it's about talking to the right people and asking the right questions. And these are things that you can develop more and more when you learn to practice curiosity, apply it into your problem solving. Basically see a very adaptive probability-based thinking for risk and safety. The more they show me, the more aggressive I can be, the less they show, the more defensive I have to be. And because he's walking back to the lane already, it's going to give him a kill because his Pudge is TPing, he's around to deal the damage, and boom, this feels great. Because Magnus is dead, because Storm is showing mid, he can push out this entire bottom wave, and now he goes back to variation number one. But here's where he even takes it to the next level. This is something you can try to incorporate. The reason why we do this is to give us the most gold possible, but to put us in the best position naturally on the map. That is what a good farming pattern does. It gives you a lot of gold it gives a lot of experience but it naturally puts you in a nice position to move from camp to camp from camp to tower and so on but you need to play off of what you see the more info you have the better information like the more info you have the better decisions you can make here i think this is a very very nice example he kills the entire wave he's ready to walk to the triangle right now right to just like farm some creeps here and chill they're stacking for him but he sees that the storm tp is top he sees storm is top he sees storm is low mana which means instead of farming the triangle He's just going to go and hit the mid tower. You know, he has the option to farm triangle creeps or pressure the map. He goes for pressuring the map simply because he knows he's allowed to do this because Storm does not have a TP. The only one that can stop him from doing this is the Storm Spirit. At minute, like 5.45. So that's a great point. Knowing the people or the things that prevent you from doing what you actually want. And if you know that condition is removed, then you can actually do whatever it is that you want. So I think that's two things. Number one, it's knowing what you want to do, right? Knowing what you want to do is based on knowing your character's tendency or your hero's tendency, what the hero wants to do, and knowing the timing, right? So for example, uh, carry heroes at the early stages want to farm because they don't have money. Uh, they don't have gold. They're, they're not strong yet. But carry heroes in the later stages want to take objectives as much as possible. If it's if you can get away with it, take the objectives. But while we're weak, while we're level one, level two, there's no objectives to be taken. It's just take your lane creeps and keep going. In a software engineering perspective, you can think about it from the perspective of, I want to gain a certain skill, for example, software architecture, because I want to get to this level of compensation by uh, the timing of 2025 or 2026, right? So right now I'm a junior engineer. That's my level one, level two. Uh, I'm a hero that's farming. In two years, I want to be able to reach the level of software architecture so that I can earn this kind of um, compensation. What do I need to do? I need to gain information about what a software architecture kind of role looks like. What kinds of compensation do they get? What's the roadmap towards that kind of role? 
and then knowing what you want, like thinking about what actually holds you back from that. Well, when you think about it, what's your opponent when you think about the job market? Well, technically it could be like, you could think about it from the recruiter's perspective or the hiring manager. They would basically be throwing you questions like, well, what's your experience in software design? So then this boils down to, okay, my condition is software design. Have I been able to practice software design? Is that the condition that I've met? If I have met it already, then maybe I am open to the opportunity to already try being a software uh, architect and see the other things that I might need to get that kind of job. Otherwise, you can't really take that chance. You can't really take that interview because you're not ready for that kind of thing. That would be basically Storm Spirit being in mid lane and saying, you know, Where's your credentials? Well, what do you got? You know, how are you going to do software architecture if you don't know software design patterns and such? It's knowing what you want and knowing which conditions prevent you from getting what you want. All right, so we started the replay. He, Yatoro is 2.7k net worth. He's level four. So like he's one and a half levels behind this Pango, one and a half levels behind Storm. You know, he's doing okay on a net worth, top three. At minute 1120, after doing the ping pong concept for five minutes, Yatoro is 1,000 gold ahead of his Pangolier. He is one and a half levels above the enemy life stealer. He's taking the enemy mid tower, and he is just by far the top gold in the game. And he's nearly as high level as his mid laner, same level as the enemy mid laner. And here just comes down to the three variations. If you feel very safe, you can farm it here, go like this and come back. If you feel a little less safe, let the wave run further and closer to your tower. Go here, farm it in your tower, farm the south side camps. And if you feel really, really, really in danger, that is the first time where you farm absolutely fully backwards. And then you look to come back to the lane with, depending on the info you have on the map. Of course, this applies on the dire side too, but this concept is very easy. It should help you to get top net worth in most of your games. Unless your lane went really poorly, then that's on you. Thanks a lot for watching. Let me know down below what you'd like. So I think it was a great breakdown uh, from Kaju. Um, one thing that I want to highlight is that it's important to recognize that the way that he framed it was that it's a ping pong strategy. And when you think about it from ping pong, there's an ebb and flow to all of these kinds of things. It's knowing the timing, the way that the risk and safety evolves over time, and then finding that kind of rhythm and kind of movement throughout that map. Thinking about which camps have I already taken and which camps are available and what's the game state, what's the map looking like. And when you think about it from software engineering perspective, you think about, okay, is the company in a strong position right now? Okay, then maybe I have more opportunities to kind of negotiate for a certain kind of role that can help generate more revenue because people are spending a lot in the economy. So uh, people are spending uh, on the products that we're building. But if, for example, the game state, right, the world is like, okay, we're kind of like entering a kind of recession. So then this might be, okay, then the company that I'm working with might be more interested on ways on how to cut down on costs. So you know that they're sensitive about costs. So if you can design a, a kind of business challenge or a business case where you're able to come up with okay, here's the kinds of costs that we see, for example, in maybe operations or in customer support, you know, uh, or sales. And we can actually cut down on our costs if we introduce this certain solution. Maybe you come up with some idea or you come up with some kind of additional measurement, right? Measurement is important to business because that's like putting observer words into certain things. And you can now measure more, you can have more information that helps the business. In that sense, it's just finding that kind of ebb and flow of the business so that you can fluidly adapt to the opportunities, whether it's risk-free and you can take strong advantage of the best lane creeps and best opportunities afforded to you by your company and surrounding circumstances. Or if things are looking bad, it's knowing how to play conservatively, keeping yourself safe, going through the jungles, going to you closer to your team. So if you guys like this breakdown, please let me know in the comments below. If you're interested in coaching and mentoring for mid to senior level software engineers, if you want to get to that level of critical thinking and problem solving that senior level software engineers are capable of doing, we have a coaching and mentoring program in tome.cg where we tackle three very important skills. It's communication, best practices and growth, and learning to navigate complex scenarios. And we do that through role play and analogies through games. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Hit like and subscribe. Continue to watch more about our content. Thanks.